Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to get started on chapter four, and we're going to do this in two parts. This first part, we're going to talk about the first part of predictive analytics, and we're going to start taking a look at data mining, and we're going to go into a little bit about the processes, and we're going to take a look at some methods. The second part, we'll continue on methods, and we'll start taking a look at some algorithms. So what we're going to be starting to cover here are defining it, <clears throat> defining uh, data mining, and some of the objectives and benefits and start talking about a little bit of the applications and some processes. And again, we'll, we'll pick up with the rest of these parts in part two, which we'll be talking about next week. <clears throat> so to start off with some concepts and definitions around what, we're, what we mean by data mining and what this really is. Um, as we are getting into more of using data as the new competitive advantage uh, in a lot of our businesses, <clears throat> we're looking at these vast data stores that we have in our databases, our data warehouses, and <clears throat> information systems or information technology really doesn't tend to be the new uh, or the competitive advantage anymore. <clears throat> Everyone has some level of information systems. If you don't, at this point, you're probably out of business. So it's really down to the data as the new part of our competitive advantage and how you're mining it what trends you're identifying in it, and how you're able to leverage your data. So <clears throat> this is really what's driving more intense competition uh, of all of our businesses across the globe. We're uh, doing a better job of recognizing the value of all of our data in our data stores and what we can do with it, not just in terms of brute force selling that data to data mining companies or people, uh, research companies or places that can do something, their own analysis against the data, but harnessing it internally and what we can do to identify those trends and patterns and what we can do with that data. <clears throat> and what's changing is the availability of quality data, um, clean data, data that we can actually use right off the bat for our own customers, data that we have on our vendors, their performance, their customer, um, their um, their different products and how well those products perform, perhaps, you know, in our sales, um, information about those sales in general, the transactions and, and what kind of data we have on the online mediums that we use, web, social media, <clears throat> and so on. And then <clears throat> we start taking a look at the consolidation, the integration of the different data repositories that we have. We have so many different types of databases and data stores but with them all living in disparate places and storing data in their own ways, um, it's really bringing these into a data warehouse where we can then have all the different pieces and databases lining up side by side, all the different fields, transactions, what have you, sitting side by side. So where we can begin to an analyze and uh, analyze what's happening with them all and try to identify trends that might be coming up that you really can only identify through the um, analysis of vast amounts of data um, that's available in the data warehouse. And of course, through the exponential increase of processing and storing capabilities, and this comes because of, in part, the decrease in cost um, associated with storage, for instance, and the, the decreased cost associated with um, buying horsepower for performance, uh, server core capabilities, um, RAM, and so on. And the movement of conversion of information resources to a non-physical form. And in here, I'll kind of lump in cloud computing, for instance. Um, data doesn't necessarily just live in hard drives in our data center somewhere. Um, we're able to move all of this to cloud storage environments. Um, just as an example, um, so that we're not constantly having to try to physically uh, manage our vast data stores as well. So we'll get into some definitions here, um, starting on this next slide. So um, this first definition, just the non-trivial processes of identifying valid, novel, potentially useful, and ultimately understandable patterns in data stored in structured databases. So let's take this apart just a little bit, kind of understanding what's happening here. So some of the big takeaways, the things to look at, <clears throat> highlight within this particular definition, uh, of course, it's a process, meaning this is kind of a, 
a step-by-step -step way of working or analyzing what we have in front of us. Uh, we're not just kind of coming at this through any particular means. This is very structured. <clears throat> Non-trivial, meaning we're not dealing with small amounts of work. We're dealing with large amounts of data sets in this instance. Valid, we know the data is good. Novel, we're trying to do this in unique, um, different ways. <laughs> Hopefully, potentially useful, of course, and understandable. The data has meaning. We know what to we know we can extract um, some understanding or some meaning from this data. Is data mining a bit of a misnomer? Well, yes and no. Uh, we're not technically you know, going down into the mines, of course, of our data centers and with an ax and a pick and pulling out data. Uh, to a point, we're not actually going into the database and having to break free little tiny bits of data from larger data stores and then reassemble that in a different way. Um, it's probably better to think of it just in this next bullet point where it's more of knowledge extraction, um, pattern analysis, discovery, harvesting, and this big one here is pattern searching. So we're looking at these vast stores and trying to identify some kind of pattern within this definition or within these data sets and, and, and data dredging here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm also going to post online an, an article that I want you just to take a look at around pattern searching, pattern analysis. Um, and maybe you've heard the story before. Um, just so just take a look at that article. I think it's interesting and folks reference it from time to time and uh, maybe you've heard of it as well. So what kind of goes into into data mining? What disciplines are there? So there's a couple different disciplines that live inside of this statistics, AI, some ML machine learning pattern recognition along with that. Um, so visualization is huge because we want to um, you know, have some way to represent this at the end. Of course, database management, data warehousing um, management and methodologies there, data science, and of course, information systems are all part of this data mining as its own discipline. So what are some of the characteristics that are involved in here? Um, some of the objectives that we're trying to achieve through data mining that the source of data mining is hopefully and typically and in the best case possible scenario, a consolidated or one big data warehouse. Does it always work that way? No, of course not. Um, it is, it works the best, data mining works the best. Um, it will be as, it will work faster um, it is going to be easier to handle the data and um, report on and work with. If it is all in one nice, concise, easy to work with database, but let's face it, life doesn't always work out the way that we want it to. <clears throat> and there are times when you're going to have to join disparate data sets through a set of joins or, or what have you. <clears throat> but again, you can kind of always hope for the best case scenario, but sometimes not. <clears throat> it's usually a client server architecture um, where you're working on the end, end user client through SQL Server, SQL Server reporting services, integration services, Cognos, Tableau, anything like that um, to try to do some data mining, SAS, SPSS, something like that. Uh, and you're connecting back to some main server environment somewhere else. You may also be connected to a web server environment in a cloud-based system or something to that nature or some kind of reporting portal. That's fine too. And of course, data is our main ingredient for this. Um, hopefully it is nice, all pretty structured data, um, text data that's not sentences and it all came from nice, pretty drop down menus and you didn't have to clean it but life also doesn't work out that way either. And you may find yourself dealing with the spelling of Pennsylvania in 14 different ways. And you have to figure out how to um, consolidate those all and, and course correct for them. Um, 
you could be dealing with unstructured data where you're trying to mine the data of pictures and you have to go into metadata, for instance, or um, you're trying to use machine learning um, to handle unstructured data, or you're trying to scrape uh, tags off of um, Twitter or Instagram or something like that. And you're, you're working with some unstructured data, which is going to need some cleanup. The person doing the mining is, and oftentimes, the person that's actually going to be using uh, the findings. Um, typically, they're one and the same person. The data miner isn't always handing it off to somebody else, but in some case it is. Um, if you want to strike it rich being a data miner, it's a lot of creative thinking. Um, how in the world are we possibly going to solve this problem? How are we going to find this data? What patterns are there? What analysis can I use? Um, this all is thinking out of the box kind of stuff because um, so much of the rules are unwritten. Um, so much of the data has been um, <clears throat> not, not mined or there's no process for it or Maybe what you're looking for, because of the definition of just being new and novel, um, no one's done it before. So um, <clears throat> finding what you're looking for may require some creative out-of-the-box thinking. And whatever tools you're looking at, um, an ease of use of these are essential because you're going to be wanting to spend your time on your analysis, your pattern searching, your algorithm. So whatever tools you're using, um, making them easy to use and hopefully fast uh, really is going to be of, of a paramount importance to what you're doing. So how do we get data out of what it is that we're looking for? We're actually just really looking for extraction of patterns. So what could be a pattern? Well, there's a lot of different types of patterns we can have. We could be looking for mathematical patterns. Um, and you could be looking for series of random numbers or repeating numbers, and that could be the pattern that you're looking for inside the data. Um, you know, if you're looking for certain types of transactions in an OLTP database and um, that could indicate fraud, every time you see a certain number of transactions, a quantity or um, a volume um, or an amount of that transaction, and it happens with some frequency or you know, it happens in a certain pattern that could indicate fraud. Um, and that could be what you're after. Um, there could be other types of patterns around association, prediction, clustering their segmentation of the market patterns. Um, so many things may happen based on weather, based on patterns or time of the year, things like that. And sequential time series, things happen certain parts of the day, you know, um, certain items on a menu at a restaurant are only pattern or only they they have a pattern that follows um, the time of a day and it would be pretty rare to have them outside of that but um, those things um, if they are bought outside of their normal pattern could indicate something going on in the marketplace or could indicate you know something else going on in the environment which has some other kind of a trigger. So there's other things that um, <clears throat> these patterns, looking for them can help you identify. So just a little bit of uh, this continued taxonomy on the data mining, some things that you're looking for around, um, we'll start off with uh, data mining tasks, some methods here, just looking at prediction first. You know, if we wanna talk about classification, what are the algorithms or what tools can you use um, that we're probably more familiar with um, around classification, just a decision tree. Um, I'm sure all of us have worked in some point with a decision tree. We want to look, we talked a little bit about regressions, linear, nonlinear regressions, um, time series. You can use some averaging methods, some auto regressions there as well. Um, some of these other methods around association, segmentation, um, we haven't discussed and um, we'll talk a little bit more about them as we move through, um, through this chapter and through the rest of the course. So I don't want to get too far ahead of, of what it is that we're doing. Just keep these in mind um, and we're going to talk about some of these as we move along.
So we'll start off on some of these, um, some of the patterns um, <coughs> around forecasting with the time series forecasting. Um, part of a series, a sequence, I'm sorry, um, or a link analysis. Um, <coughs> pardon me. The visualization, um, just another data mining task after you tend to have your results, whatever they may be, putting them in some sort of visualization so that you can hand it off into the next person. And then the question of data mining versus statistics, are they the same? Um, and what's the relationship between the two? Well, that's a, a bit of a tricky question. Um, you're gonna, you will end up using some statistics potentially on the data that you pull out, um, but <clears throat> they're not necessarily the same, but um, you may use the statistics built on uh, the data you're pulling out. Um, they, will, they will definitely, the statistics will lie heavily on the data that you are coming up with. So what are some applications that we can <clears throat> unleash data mining on? So we talk about CRMs or the customer relationship management. Um, you know, in this realm, we can look at maximizing the return of marketing campaigns, um, seeing what's actually coming back into us. Um, customer retention, <clears throat> this is often called churn. Uh, churn is how, how much do we keep a customer, how much we lose a customer. <clears throat> customer value or maximizing that, cross-selling, upselling, um, identifying and treating our, our most valued customers. If we go into the banking sector, financial sectors, <clears throat> can we use data mining to automate the loan process? Looking up um, customers' loans and their other debt or credit to help that move along. I mentioned a little earlier about fraudulent transactions. Um, we can take a look at, you know, <clears throat> transactions against uh, bank accounts to identify those fraud alerts. You know, you just had two transactions in Pittsburgh and all of a sudden you have an, a transaction in India. It is kind of unlikely that that happened or you had a transaction in Pittsburgh, a transaction in China and a transaction in California. It's pretty unlikely that there that pattern can happen and then you all of a sudden you get that that call from your credit card company. Hey, we noticed fraudulent activity. Well, that is um, automated data mining at work that's letting us um, that, that we're benefiting from. Again, with the customer value and um, using that to kind of um, manage our cash reserves, uh, some forecasting about things that might be coming in the marketplace to um, help us plan better for the future. We can look at retail, logistics, helping us with inventory levels, you know, maybe getting to a just-in-time inventory system versus keeping months and months on inventory at hand. We can actually <clears throat> use data mining to see how quickly we are actually going through some of our inventory. Um, <clears throat> we can analyze how customers move through the store, um, seasonal effects on um, our products, and minimize losses due to shelf life, understand how quickly we sell through things, versus their sell by dates and try to try to minimize what we keep in stock or when we do our ordering and get to that just in time ordering. Um, getting down into manufacturing and maintenance, predict uh, machine failures. There's a, a metric that's often called MBTF, mean time between failures. And this happens a lot in manufacturing. It's a lot in the electronics industry. And if you're buying servers, switches, routers for your business, you know, um, for instance, a um, uh, you know, a router or a Cisco router for your office that does your networking may have a mean time between failure of six years. Um, means that, and that means that, that piece of equipment might be able to work for about six years be before it starts to fail. And that can help us with um, planning when we need to do replacements. Now, those, those pieces of equipment, depending on the size, can cost $15,000. It's not the end of the world. But what if you have equipment that costs millions of dollars or hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, <clears throat> you're gonna want better statistics on how long something can last bet between, you have to, uh, between the time you may have to replace it. Uh, and that can also help you with that lead time to know when you need to have something in the pipeline already on order. Um, identify anomalies in production systems. Um, so you can identify when something um, it starts to produce um, items that you may not be able to sell so that you can course correct <clears throat> and get into maybe some more Six Sigma 
um, manufacturing techniques and discover, discover novel patterns to improve product quality, ways that people may not have thought of before um, to improve the way that you're um, make, you know, making your products to make them uh, perform a little bit better. Getting into securities and brokerage, um, predict changes in markets like the bond market, forecast uh, stock fluctuations, um, and so on there. <clears throat> Taking a look at the insurance market, forecasting claims costs based on patterns in uh, a particular region or do better business planning, help with rate determinations, um, and optimize marketing to our customers in you know a specific situation or region, things like that. And again, all about fraud. Um, much of data mining really helps um, identify and um, work with um, with fraud or protect against fraud. Taking a look at some of the other applications here. Um, some of the, the computer hardware applications, really what we have here, uh, you can run a lot of these applications on many computers, it depends really if it's client server based, um, you know, how much horsepower you really need. Um, of course, there's lots of different examples we can use in science and engineering, um, testing the limits of, of buildings based off of known, known information that we have about the things that have currently been built. Of course, government and defense, you can um, look at contracting, you can look at defense and everything around <clears throat> maybe even missile trajectory based on weather patterns and so on. Homeland security, law enforcement, travel, entertainment, goodness, everything about sports and predicting and gambling, betting. There's tons, tons to do with data mining around bookmaking. Um, healthcare and medicine, absolutely with data mining, predicting how well patients will respond to certain medications using data mining to look at patients with certain certain comorbidities that is certain diseases um, that when put together can make a patient have a certain amount of risk that they could end up with a life-threatening condition or end up in, in an ed in the emergency department for instance and again back to sports because there is so much you uh, that folks are doing with data mining to try to predict that again. So just a little bit about the process for <clears throat> data mining. Um, the concept of the best practices still tends to be evolving somewhat and different companies, different sectors, different businesses may all have their own concept of what a best practice may be. And whatever company you move into, if this is where you feel like you may be headed, uh, you're certainly going to want to understand how it is that they they do their business. Um, but everybody has kind of a broad understanding of how this will work and how we're going to do things that we're going to live within there. But then there's, of course, some nuance to that and always a systematic way of doing it. And that's the term process. Process implies some kind of a systematic way. Um, this is the next slide here talking about moving from art to science for the data mining project. <clears throat> I will I will say that yes, this moves from a bit of an art to a science and then I'm gonna also say it goes right back to an art. So much around information systems, technology, database work is an art and a science and it flows in my opinion fluidly back and forth. Um, <clears throat> There is so much to an art to figure out, you know, how we work with our data and how messy it is and, and how we have to interpret that. <clears throat> and <clears throat> when we put on our business analyst hat and we have to get those requirements from our end users and our sponsors um, <clears throat> and we have to, you know, finesse them a little bit to understand and get to the root of what they're actually looking for. We have to work with those project sponsors to finesse a little extra money out of them so that we can get this project off the ground or um, to get some extra funding for something that we're trying to do. Um, and then we're really working with really tried and true scientific algorithms or methodologies. Um, and then, you know, we have to go back to the art of the visualization and um, the art of coaxing the data out of the database. This is fluid. And we move back and forth from art to science and right back to art and right back to science through the entire project. 
So don't feel like this is a one-way street in any direction. You're going to go <clears throat> back and forth the entire time. Understand that everybody has a different version and vision uh, <laughs> for how this will look and how it's going to work. And you're kind of just going to need to navigate that through communication um, and trial and error and a little bit of mocking up from time to time of here's how I think this is going to work. So some common standard processes here are the cross industry standard process for data mining, CRISP DM, SEMA, sample, explore, modify, model and assess, and the KDD, knowledge discovery in the databases. So we're going to look at this first one, the CRISP DM here on the next slide. <clears throat> This was proposed in the 1990s um, over by our friends um, in Europe, and there's six phases. Now, these first three phases are very much in that art part of the process, understanding the business, understanding the data, and preparing the data. This is very, very much in the artistic part of this because business is just as much of an art as it is a science as well. And to be able to do anything, you fully, fully, fully have to understand really what's going on um, with, with the underlying foundation of what you're about to work with. So understanding the business, data understanding, data prep is where you're going to spend most of your time. Then you're going to move on to four, where step four, where you're building the model. Step five, you're doing your testing and your eval. And six is you're deploying your data mining uh, process. <clears throat> so pretty straightforward here, six steps. Um, but you know, I can always say the 80-20 rule applies to most things where you spent 80% of your time on 20% of your thing or 20% uh, of your tasks. And there's definitely that going on here. You're going to percent spend about 80% of your time on just three steps, um, which is all preparation steps, basically. Moving next, uh, to the next part of the the Chris DM here, just kind of a visual of how this actually works, and it's definitely cyclical. Once you deploy it, um, you may find yourself coming back and tweaking the process. You know a little bit more about the business, and you know a little bit more about the data, and you may find yourself tweaking this and, and coming all back um, and starting all over, tweaking your model or um, uh, creating potentially an entire new uh, entire new one. <clears throat> So the next we talked about was SEMA, the uh, Sample, Explore, Modify, Model, and Assess. Uh, this came out from SAS. SAS is also a data um, mining software, data modeling software, statistics package. So the first step, sample, generate a representative sample of the data. And the next step, explore the visualization and basic description of the data. So visualize it, kind of explore what um, what data elements are actually present, what you have to work with, what you're looking at. Next, you're going to modify. You're going to look at those variables, and then you're going to transform the uh, different variable representations so that you can <clears throat> um, really hone in exactly what it is that you're going to be looking for, what you're going to be representing. Then you're going to create a model. Use a variety, whatever statistical models that you're going to use or machine learning models, you're going to create that model. And then you're going to go look at the assessment of it. So after you have your model, after you have some output, you're going to take a look at it. <clears throat> Is this what I thought I would get? Is this what I wanted to get? Does this look like what I was hoping to get? And then you're going to not necessarily start all over as the model implies, but you're going to go back to the honing and hone that a little bit further until you ultimately get exactly what it is that you're looking for. So while yes, it is cyclical and you do continue around to uh, explore and modify and, <clears throat> and, and that and so forth, um, you kind of are continuing with the exact same, um, same model that you were already working with. The last one here is the knowledge discovery in database process. Um, this, has a little bit of the SEMA in it where you're kind of looking at the data in the bottom left corner, selecting it, doing a little bit of cleaning, transforming a little bit. There is your data mining step. And then there's this process here 
where it starts turning into a little bit of what I think is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where you um, become very philosophical and you're internalizing this, this data mining and you're saying, you know, does this, am I solving what I needed to solve here? And you're really pondering it and you're hoping that you're getting out of it what you wanted. And that's the internalization. Um, did you get knowledge out of this? Is there actionable insight? Can we create new business rules or business processes out of what we just found? Um, in this KDD model. Um, how do these models rank? How are they actually used? The crisp one is used the most. Uh, and then um, so people just have their own and this is how I do it and this is how it works. And then SEMA KDD, the organization specific one, something that <laughs> may be a little bit more within the domain, meaning healthcare or finance or entertainment, sports, something along those lines. And then another methodology is just like uh, down at the bottom there. And then of course there's none where I just kind of stab at it and throw stuff at the wall until something sticks. There's, <laughs> there's that too. So <clears throat> um, data mining methods, the classification model of <clears throat> the data mining methods is the most frequently used. So once we start getting data out, uh, classifying it in terms of um, really what goes together. <clears throat> and it's part of machine learning. Uh, machine learning likes to uh, classify all of our data together while it understands the world around it. It's supervised learning. <clears throat> we, um, if you're employing machine learning, it's uh, as the machine is trying to understand what data it's being presented, it often um, is reaching back to the user and um, verifying its understanding um, and classifying is very much doing that. You're kind of um, overseeing the process of the classification. <clears throat> it's learning from the past data. It's understanding what's past data and then classifying new data according to what it's already learned. <clears throat> the output variable is categorical, uh, categorical. We learned before nominal and ordinal. A nominal could be whatever type of grouping it has. Um, and ordinal, um, maybe like a, <laughs> a different type of uh, grouping based on perhaps size, small medium, or, small, medium, or large, for instance. Classification versus regression. What's the difference between these two? You know, a classification will put things into a specific group, small, medium, large, um, first, second, third. Um, <clears throat> it will put cat, dog. Regression will not do that. Regression is looking at an X and a Y and figuring out what effect X has on Y or what effect Y has on X. It's um, not, it's looking for the relationship or potential relationship between two items versus a category, which is just kind of grouping them together based on <clears throat> qualities. Classification versus clustering, you're getting a little bit closer. Um, Classification is a little bit closer together versus than <clears throat> classification and regression. Regression, goodness, regression. Um, with a cluster, you're putting all like items together that have some similar characteristic. Um, cats with um, that are gold in color, cats that are black in color, cats that are gray in color, cats that are white in color. Um, they're still all the classification of a cat but they're being clustered together. So the data mining is still pulling all the cats together, herding all the cats, but it's clustering them together based on, um, based on their nominal group uh, of color. Some assessment methods here we have next. Uh, for classification, you can have a predictive accuracy, a hit rate, for instance, and we can we can throw that into sports, um, um, or you can also say uh, the likelihood that something is going to be a potential match can also be a hit rate. Um, so, you know, if we're clustering cats, we're counting cats, um, the likelihood that the next cat is going to be an orange cat based on the number of cats that we've already mined and the percentage of those cats that were orange based on or versus the percent of cats that were other colors, um, we can start to determine the hit rate possibility of the next cat coming up being orange or something. The speed, the model building versus predicted usage speed. So 
you know, how quick uh, the model is going to, uh, we can build this model and how quick it will work. The robustness, how quick it's a, it's, this model is able to handle other things. Um, you know, you could have a very small dog that could get thrown into this mix. And if we're looking at data that's um, looking at, you know, the weight of the animal uh, and you have a, a chihuahua that comes through um, that's, that's, I don't know, a black chihuahua, um, could the model handle that? Is it going to throw it out um, because it realizes that this is a dog or is it going to put it into the black cat group? Um, is the model able to handle that? Scalability, how, how much can we grow this model to handle, of course, more cats? Um, can it be grown, can, you know, can it be augmented on or, you know, modulized to, modularized, I guess, to handle other types of classifications? Uh, interpretability, can you explain it? Can you help other people understand it? Or is this kind of a black box system where stuff goes in and it comes out the other end? Um, as a model and organized, you know, will you be able to explain this to other people? Accuracy of the classification models. There's a whole lot of formulas here that I'm not going to necessarily ask you about. Um, but you could have um, the matrix, the confusion matrix on the right, or uh, information asking you about the confusion matrix on the right uh, pop up in your future endeavors in this course. So in classification problems, the primary source for accuracy X, uh, estimation is the confusion matrix. So on the top there, you have a true or observed class. On the left, you have predicted um, class. And there's this, met, this um, matrix, rather not uh, something will be confused easily uh, by using the model. Up next here, I have some estimate, estimation methodologies for classification, single or simple split uh, estimation. The single split, um, you can also call it a holdout or a test sample estimation. Split the data into two mutually exclusive sets. And here we just have <clears throat> the data is getting split into a training set and a testing set. <clears throat> And then we're going to run the prediction accuracy um, against those particular ones um, to see how well that the, um, the model will do. For neural networks, the split is done into three, training, validation, and testing, for instance. Um, another one, the, cross, uh, the fold cross validation, this is a rotational estimation. Um, data is split into however many, we're just calling it K here, mutual subsets and K number of experiments. Um, and the, that same graphical depiction is done the same number of times. Uh, it's, it's put here in a graphical depiction of it, but that same experiment for confusion or uh, validation is done the same number of times. Some additional estimation uh, methodologies that you can find in here are to leave one out. Similar to the k-fold, um, they have k number of samples. Uh, you may just have k minus one number of samples. Bootstrapping, a random sampling with replacement. So you're just going to take one out and replace it with one from a different sample. Jackknifing is similar to leave one out. And the area under the ROC curve, the AUC, <clears throat> and that's going to come up with the next couple of slides here. So the ROC, the receiver operating characteristics, and um, this is borrowed from radar processing. So the next slide here. So this works with a binary classification system. And here we just have a couple of curves. Uh, we'll explain it a little more next here. Um, this produces the values from zero to one. A random chance is 0.5 and a perfect classification is one, produces a good assessment for skewed data classes um, as well. Um, at this point, we're not going to have to do too much with this. Um, this is just talking about um, what, let me go play from the current slide here. Um, <clears throat> this is talking about um, some of the possible estimation and validation tests that we have here. But um, we will talk, uh, these will just be uh, discussed as we talk about uh, some of the data warehousing and um, validation models going forward. 
So this brings us to the end of the first part of the predictive analytics. And we'll be covering this in two sections and then we'll have an activity um, on the third uh, week of this chapter. We're breaking it up over multiple pieces because it's there's kind of a lot in this chapter and it just it'd be easier if we go a little slowly through it and then work on our activity. So after you watch this video, if you have any questions, uh, please, of course, email me. Also take a look at the uh, article that I've posted in Blackboard as well. Thank you all very much.